Uh, so up next, we have a presentation on climate reality, regeneration of the landscape, uh, presented by Sean Mastretti, principal of Studio Petrocore, and Lee Adams of the Los Angeles Arboretum. Uh, Sean Mastretti is the principal of Studio Petrocore and the creator of the talk series, Climate Reality, Regeneration of the Landscape. And he's been designing lush, vibrant green spaces and environmentally sensible gardens since 2006. Sean is a designer, plantsman, licensed landscape architect, certified arborist, licensed landscape contractor, and educator. His unique background combines extensive horticultural experience, strong composition skills, and environmentally sensible practices with a wide palette of visually and textu textually interesting California-friendly plants, breathing new life and a sense of place into every garden. Lee Adams is an educator, eco-sensitive designer, and horticultural interpreter, interpreter at the LA County Arboretum and Botan Botanic Gardens. She has trained many county agencies in regenerative practices, as well as conducting hands-on workshops with local schools and professional groups. Her love of uh, collaboration and education infuse all aspects of her work, leaving participants with a profound sense of empowered accomplishments. Please welcome Sean and Lee Adams. And I'm afraid to stand in the seats up front. Come on up if you want. Get my bearings here. Thank you to the Valley Water District for <clears throat> inviting us up here today. Um, and um, thank you for being here. Um, there is nothing new under the sun. The solutions we're about to share with you have been available to us since the dawn of humans. We just wish to reconnect you to that today. But before we begin, um, I always ask Lee to give an acknowledgement to um, indigenous peoples and their wisdom, because that is what has inspired a lot of this work that we do. Thank you. We like to acknowledge that we are on native land. The indigenous people here, the Ohlone, the Miwok, the ancestors, cared for this land, took care of this land, and continue to do so. The notable thing is that we fail to thank them. We, we wish to do that. We also like to point out that in every case where indigenous people are caring for the land, the biodiversity is the greatest in North America. So please extend that invitation to the people you know, thank them, and let's work together for solutions for all of us. Okay, so here we are. Um, lovers of plants, lovers of nature. We can agree, and we do, <laughs> that our exposure to nature in our formative years has influenced our work today. As it turns out, if you're to become friends with plants, you are also going to become <coughs> familiar with their counterparts, soil, carbon, water, and biodiversity. All things are connected above and below ground, and that is what supports community for all of us. So we are out of time. The global conversation. <laughs> The global conversation is focused on the problems, and for good reason. We are in trouble. But we have solutions, and it's just a matter of implementing them. We believe that protecting our soils, treating carbon as our frenemy, optimizing our water use, supporting biodiversity, and supporting community throughout all five kingdoms will help to offset the effects of climate change in the most beautiful way. I'd like to think that I might be a messenger from the past. I suppose it's the future. <laughs> but the facts are, humans are living in a degenerative relationship with nature. Sustainability is a great effort, but it isn't nearly enough. And if we want to thrive alongside with nature, we must start thinking and acting regeneratively. We recently came across this quote that has inspired this next generation of talks and moving forward. You never change things <clears throat> by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. This is something we are trying to do in our lives at home, in our office, and especially in every project that we work on. Thank you. Thank you. So, 
So what is entropy? We live with it every day. Entropy is the breaking down of systems. Um, Sean, you're going uh, to... It's a, okay. a, a new gadget I'm not familiar with. So entropy is the breaking down of systems, all systems. We all experience it. Unfortunately, right now we are experiencing accelerated uh, entropy. And the best we can do is slow it down. There are positive and negative feedback loops. Positive feedback loops contribute to ongoing issues with climate change. So here's an example. We all are familiar with these fires. The fires put out massive amounts of CO2 and pollution. That increases the heat. That means we have more fires. It's a positive feedback loop. And we'd like to slow that down. So that's why we're here. Apathy. What is it? Oh. <laughs> we propose that to challenge your apathy, get yourself into action to create hope. Hope looks like action, and action is hope. What keeps us from being in action? Are we overwhelmed? Do we really know what to do with that? Are you feeling empowered? It or what keeps us from doing something? Whoops, did I skip that? Or I jumped ahead. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm, I'm working with a new gadget and not quite there yet. Uh, that is overwhelming. How do we deal with that? But are there other things that keep us from being in action? Like greed, selfishness. Do we really care? I know you care because you're here. So the climate, global climate change is irrefutable. There is no denying it. Temperatures in the Antarctic soared in the last two weeks. We had in eight days the greatest loss of ice ever happening on this planet. There is a new island that was revealed from the rapid ice melt at the Antarctic. Ooh, bushfires. We know what it looks like. This is what it feels like. And will feel like for some time to come. Concentration of carbon dioxide is hitting record highs and it is climbing daily. Whew. There it goes, up, 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 and causing us to lose up to 50% of all land-based species in this century. We've seen half of them disappear in the last 30 years, and we are at risk for losing another 50% in this century. Looks pretty bleak, doesn't it? The monarchs are gone. The bumblebees are almost non-existent. By 2050, there will be no commercial fisheries. More plastics than fish in our ocean. But there is good news. There is hope. There is something that gives me chills even to think telling you about it. Tackling climate change starts with planting trees. One trillion trees is what we need. In Ethiopia, 350 million trees on July 28th, and they plan on planting 4 billion more. The science supports that younger, more diverse forests sequester more carbon than other growth, older growth forests, and twice as much as areas with one species. Lucky for the planet, the armies in China and India are now planting trees at record rates. We can plant trees, diverse trees, and let go of that old image of the arbolade with identical trees on both sides. 
Let's get diversity into those trees and support habitat. And Sean can show us how to do that. Okay. So this is what our atmosphere truly looks like. This is taken from the International Space Station. <clears throat> it's not unique, but it's important because it tr clearly represents the true nature of the sky. When you walk outside and look up, it seems like a vast, limitless expanse, but if, as scientists have, have long understood, <clears throat> it's a very thin shell around our planet. If you were to drive at a normal, a normal interstate highway speed straight up into the sky, you'd reach the top of that space in about five to 10 minutes where you couldn't breathe anymore. That's the thinness of this space. And this is the space we've been using as an open sewer for the gaseous waste of all of our civil, civilizations. We are currently, currently spewing 110 million tons of man-made global warming pollution into that thin shell every 24 hours. We will continue to do that today, tomorrow, until we bring about meaningful change. <clears throat> the global warming pollution comes from a lot of sources, and I'm not going to concentrate on all of these. It's important to understand that agriculture is a major factor in that, but be looking out for regenerative agricultural practices. Uh, now the permafrost is melting and releasing not only CO2 but methane, but our main source is the burning of fossil fuels. And here are some of the effects. In mid-February 2018, the polar vortex split into two, bringing bitter cold to parts of North America and Europe and record warmth to the Arctic. This is what the normal jet stream should look like. And this is what it looked like in 2018. You can see it split into two in record warmth heading over the Arctic. Sounds familiar. This was last year. It split into three. I don't have the data on this year's, but we now have evidence that now Antarctica is melting at rec record rate. So the North Pole has now experienced midwinter heat waves, I'm going to now say five years in a row. Just need that updated slide. Um, <clears throat> 93% of, of the extra heat trapped by man-made global warming pollution goes into the ocean. <clears throat> the scientists are able to measure the heat buildup of the ocean much more precisely now, and uh, half of this increase has just occurred in the last 20 years. As temperatures increase, the oceans evaporate more moisture into the sky. A lot of people don't realize this, but water vapor is the number one greenhouse gas carbon dioxide is too. This is why there have been 17 1 in 1,000 year downpour events in the U.S. since 2010. You're not supposed to have more than one of those in a year, more or less 1,000 years. So this is what is being referred to as a rain bomb. And this is my favorite video. Watch the water splash down three times on two summers. This is due to all of that extra water vapor in the atmosphere. So our downpour events will become more extreme. This is here in San Jose, 2017. The same extra heat, heat causing evaporate, uh, that evaporate more water from the ocean, causing bigger downpours and floods, also pulls moisture right out of the soil at the same time, causing longer, deeper droughts. Which brings us back to home. The correlation between hotter years and more fires is very exact, and it's been long understood. The car fire burned over 229,000 acres and destroyed over 1,000 homes. But what's left standing? Trees. And the messaging out there with our utility companies is that the vegetation is the problem. The trees are being murdered in, in our neighborhood. I don't know about up here. They're being topped like crazy. But trees also hold moisture. It's the invasive grasses that were actually the flashy fuels that started the fires. So now the three most expensive wildfires in history have happened in just the last two years. Worldwide pollution kills 7 million people every single year. And it's slowly destroying our brain functions. There's a recent TED talk that uh, you just shared with me that was pretty enlightening and depressing. Uh, this is a map of deaths attributable to ambient air pollution with countries colored by number of deaths per year. The bottom line is air pollution has been shown to affect mental and cognitive abilities, particularly in children. 
and in utero. I don't want this for my family, and I don't want this for yours. Lower income urban neighborhoods and communities of colors are the ones that get affected the most. What's missing from these photo, this photo? Trees. So let's look at the total cost of carbon. From political instability to wildfires, drought, ocean acidification, climate refugees, and so on. <clears throat> it's safe to say that global warming is the number one threat to our global economy. We must shift our behaviors and our current ways of thinking. The average American has a 15 ton per year carbon footprint. In order to stay under two degrees Celsius, the average American needs to have a footprint of under two tons per year. That's an 87% change in behavior. Stop, start, right? So it's time to live differently. It's rational to feel depressed and scared right now. Trust me, putting together this presentation. Ooh. <laughs> but your feeling is valid and you are not alone. Grief and anger will move through us when we get into action. Hope is only useful when we're undertaking actions to keep hope alive. It's time to live regeneratively. There are so many ways to do this in our homes and in our communities, but we are going to share how to reconnect you with the land and help Mother Earth to regenerate. This is an opportunity to reimagine and reinvent how we as community members, municipalities, and or landscape design professionals and planners do things in our work and even in our homes. So how do we start? I love this graphic. I will always use this graphic. It clearly represents where we are and what we need. So can we implement better regenerative feedback loops? Yes. Degenerative, this is where we are today. This basically means we are destroying, depleting, reducing, and killing. Sustainability basically just means surviving and maintaining. But regenerative is thriving, renewing, recreating, and it creates abundance. Think about it. What is true sustainability? True sustainability isn't organic food shipped from three states over. It isn't water piped from miles away. And it isn't sending your recyclables to another factory or across the world that burns just that just burns more energy. Sustainability, true sustainability, is the result of a regenerative model, which is milk, um, which is making use of what we have. True sustainability is in our own two hands, in our backyards, and in our community. So, in order to get out of this, we need to get into this in order to sustain. So, how do we start from the beginning? with soil. Lee, will you guide us on meditation? I know there's a lot of icky stuff right there, so we're going to try and get into solution. Thank you. Since we're in a great place and a safe place, if I can ask you to exhale, inhale, and as you do so, close your eyes and remember a time and a place in which you were under a tree sheltered, <coughs> not worried, not scared, completely safe. Sit down or lean against the trunk or sit on a branch. Feel the soil below. There's lots of things there. Are there moving things there? Might be. Is there a smell? Bring back the smells. Bring back the listening and hear the birds, insects, and life forms habiting that tree. Underground, there's many things that we can't see that are contributing to the well-being of that tree. Feel that. Remember that. Hold on to that. And open your eyes and think about bringing that into your garden, into com community spaces, into municipal spaces, places that we feel wonderful because the community below ground is supporting the community above ground. And when we do that, we are all doing much better. Sean, how do we do that? You start by acknowledging soil first. 
on every project that we do, we always start with the soil. But what is soil? It's pretty basic. It's 50% solid space and 50% void space. At least it should be. And somewhere in there, there is some percentage of organic matter. But we pretty much impacted that topsoil, that native topsoil. <coughs> Wherever you live, you've impacted it. The grading of your property and your community. So topsoil is very minimal right now. There's a distinction between soil, living soil, and dirt. This is The distinction is that 95% of all land-based organisms exist in topsoil or in our soil. From microbes like bacteria, fungi, protozoa, and nematodes, and further up the food chain, they support us. Microbial activity drives the process of aggregation, which enhances soil structural stability, aeration, infiltration, and water holding capacity. All living things above and below ground benefit when the plant microbe bridge is functioning effectively. A plant root is very similar to our lower intestines, and a plant acquires nutrients from outside and the other from inside. Having a healthy microbiome is essential to the health of both plants and animals. Now, most people think that roots just take. That's not true. They also give. The hyphae of a mycorrhizal fungi, over here, is only a single cell wide, and it exudes acid and penetrates the root cell wall to facilitate very special exchanges. The fungus receives sugars from plants in exchange. The plant receives certain nutrients, water, protection, information. Now, even though this plant micro bridge is a very powerful tool or very powerful being, um, it's also extremely fragile. So when we use inorganic fertilizers, pesticides, herbicides, all of that, we, just, we diminish their populations and the ability to do the work that they need to do. This is just an image of mycorrhizal fungi taking advantage of cardboard only three weeks after a lasagna mulching workshop. Yay. <laughs> this is part of the work that we do, and we return carbon to the soil at the same time, but we'll get to that later. How many in this room have heard of desertification? Great. For those of you who have not, it is a global epidemic. We have already lost one-third of our farmable or arable land in the past 40 years. Desertification is a term that applies to the man-made destruction of the underlying soil resource to such a degree that it can no longer support life. <clears throat> desertification is not only in or around the desert, it can occur anywhere. Desertification is not the result of drought, although droughts can exacerbate desertification. It is a man-made phenomenon. Tilling, for example, is an 11,000-year-old mistake. Just imagine if we treated our cityscapes with access to healthy soils. I love the work of James Urban and structural cells that could be implemented underneath our sidewalks, obviously with new developments and maybe rethinking this. But what this does is this allows for water and roots and the microbial bridge to pass through. And mycorrhizal fungi connect plants together for miles and miles. And I love this image. And this is from the ASLA design workshop. This is what I hope to see in our cityscapes. When we think about our trees, we need to give them room. So having an expanded root zone, a plant community approach to help with infiltration, capturing stormwater and permeable, permeable spaces, this is a great way to be thinking about our communities. Bottom line is microbes rule the world. A healthy soil microbiome equals a healthy planet. Second, we create an alliance. Let's get comfy with carbon. We are carbon-based organisms. <clears throat> we need to know about carbon. Carbon is the most basic essential building block of life. Where there's carbon in the soil, there's water. Each human being has at least as many microorganism cells as human cells, and scientists tell us that those microorganisms were the beginning of life on Earth. <coughs> they are the key to our health, our gardens, and our food and they connect us to the soil. So let's have a look at the carbon cycle. The only arrows that I see pointing down from the atmosphere are attributed to photosynthesis, whether it's phytoplankton in the ocean or plants on land. That is carbon sequestration. Plants are so awesome that they are literally built from thin air. They are solar-powered, carbohydrate-making machines that pull carbon from the atmosphere 
and put it into the soil where it belongs. Without carbon and oxygen in the soil, microbes, fungi, and plants all working together, carbon is depleted from our soils. Water will run off, carrying topsoil pollution, pesticides, and more, and this ends up poisoning our waterways and our water supplies. The movement of carbon from the atmosphere to soil via green plants represents the most powerful tool we have at our disposal for the restoration of soil function and the reduction of CO atmospheric CO2. In the upper left corner is a microscopic view of a stomata, and that's basically the breathing mechanism of a leaf. I like to think of it as a CO2 monster. <laughs> Another way to return carbon to the soil, Lee? Oh boy, can I have you say Google culture? Google culture. Google culture. <laughs> Google means mound in German. Culture is obvious. With the trees that we are losing, instead of grinding them up or taking them away, let's put them back into the soil. Here is a hoogle over a 20-year period. We mound logs. We mound green waste. We take cardboard. We layer it in there. It creates soil. And it is a passive water harvesting system when oriented correctly. It also increases surface area, and we can build pollinator hubs in just this self-watering space that maintains itself. And we do that. We love doing that. So this is what we do. We generally excavate some soil so that we have more water capture. We add in our green waste. We layer it with soil, mulch. Um, we use the trim on the properties that we're designing. We put that back into the ground to create soil. We put smaller logs on the bottom and we put the larger logs on top. Why do we do that? because we want the thermal mass up as high as it's possible to get it. When you have a glass of cold water in your hand on a hot day, what happens? Condensation, moisture condenses. So these logs stay cooler than air temperature, and at night, <coughs> as the moist air comes in, oh, I skipped Sean's tutorial here. As, as the moist air comes in at night, then um, those logs are cooler than air temperature. And they force moisture from its gaseous state into a liquid state. Our number one problem with wood in the world is that it draws in water, and we have to seal it with fascia and special paints. So instead, let's use that. Let's use that ability to force moisture into condensation draw it in through capillary action, and then let our plants pull it out through capillary action. When oriented correctly, this is something you won't believe until you try it. So, we've gotten our local city, Pasadena, California, now has two hoogles of its own. Let's watch us pull the community together and see if this happens. Oh goodness, there's the cardboard, calling in the mycorrhizal fungi. Oh yeah, laying down our green waste from a recent trim. Soil to inoculate it. Logs from tree trimming. Mulch, soil. Let some lasagna hoogle. We're layering it. You notice the people standing back and then getting involved. Those are neighbors from the community as well as others who have come to learn about this. Now they have ownership, involvement. They care about the future of what's growing here. And it's fun. Last week 
we got to plant that with native plants and city employees and the outward bound youth group who now have skills and an investment in creating pollinator hubs, they own that in their minds. They will be driving past there for years to come and celebrating what they learned to do. Oh my goodness, I failed to mention that we can build a Google on top of pavement or concrete. And it works. You can even put one on a brown field and while it bioremediates, you can grow healthy food on top of it. So there's so much to do with this. There are other ways we can return carbon to the soil. There's mulching, composting, lasagna mulching. You saw our beautiful mycorrhizal growth in three weeks. We use biochar and bamboo vinegar. We use rainwater harvesting in every project we do. And that is a negative feedback loop, something that slows entropy. Our third point is to honor water and invite it to stay. Uh, for Miss Hawk, I would ask you, thank you. For Miss Hawk, I would invite you to consider using the term optimizing water as opposed to conservation. Conservation, we are feeling small and saving. We can feel pride in doing it. But when we optimize, we feel clever, like we just invested in the stock market and we are optimizing our funds. Hey, yeah, let's optimize. Go for it. Watch how it changes when the language changes. Oh, those hot years. We're experiencing some right now, aren't we? We had 80 degrees yesterday. The last five years, we only went to 2018 on this. The last two years continue this trend. So, did you know that on 1,000 square feet of root space in a one inch rain, you can capture, and I always want to check the number, 625 gallons of water. Wow, that's a lot of water in a one inch rain. Maybe we only have a half inch rain and we'll get 300 gallons of water. Where are we going to let it go? Down the downspout and out into the gutter? Or can we capture it? Can we capture it through rain gardens, bioswales, cisterns, tanks? If you can afford it, use it. Rain barrels, dry wells. We favor putting it in the ground, like that bioswale on the left. But when a client has the funds, look at that beautiful cistern. You're going to see some more of that when Sean comes back. Ah, there I am standing in a swale with a moogle behind me. I am happy. I will be capturing water not just from Sean's home, but from his next door neighbor's garage, from everywhere on Sean's property and the neighbor's property. We're taking that water and putting it back into the ground. There are other ways to optimize your water usage. Plant native and climate appropriate plants. Utilize gray water systems, permeable surfaces. Support regenerative agriculture. Ask about it, join the groups, learn everything you can, and support fungi. Now there's research showing us that fungal spores in the atmosphere contribute to cloud formation. So if you think about that, fungal spores leaving the uh, fungi, creating a matrix over an area, and that increases the rainfall. And this isn't just a crazy idea. This is Scientific American publishing multiple studies. It is actually true that my house gets more rain than Sean's house because I've been growing my fungi for more than 15 years. Makes his partner crazy that I get more rain than he does. We'll get you there, don't worry. Um, and once you know that that is the case, when mushrooms spring up like tulips after a good rain soaking, we get more rain, we get more mushroom. 
that is a negative feedback cycle. Ooh, good, let's go for that. So if you accept that uh, the fungal spores create a climate change, when we take out forests and reduce our living ecosystems, we lose that rain. And that is the process of desertification. Number four, once we have the holy trinity of soil, water, and carbon perfumed together, we have to support biodiversity. Food, water, place. Know that the interconnected web of life is unraveling at an unfathomable speed, and the majority of the planet is not treating this as a crisis. Plant to support biodiversity. Native plants are the first line of defense in preventing habitat loss. When we design, we must support biodiversity. We must. The feedback loop can begin with community. Uh, the wish for communion exists in the body. It is not for strategic reasons alone that gathering together has been at the heart of every movement for social change. That's from Susan Griffin. We are living under the myth of separation, the myth of individualism, and the myth of human supremacy. These myths have been going on for some time. Separation is a story. It is not true. We are not separate from the earth. We are a single, singular ecosystem, united. Everything is interconnected and we, re we aim to reconnect what has been lost. So I imagine our current lifestyle model looking something like this. A bowl with cracks in it. But let's just imagine this is our current landscape model. We waste and squander our most precious resource, water. We waste energy. We continuously pollute our ocean, our, sorry, our air, our water, and our soils with noxious products. We import and create more waste. And of course, kindness is valuable as well. Communities are woven from the foundation of interdependence, soil, of car soil, carbon, water, and biodiversity. And we are attempting to recreate and support a regenerative model that isn't depleted but grows as we grow. But first, we must start with soil. And without carbon in the soil, there is no water. And without water in the soil, we cannot support biodiversity. And biodiversity ranges from all five kingdoms, from bacteria, protista, plant, fungi, and animal. And together, they create community. And it's community that jumpstarts that feedback loop again. What if soil, carbon, water, biodiversity were all given the same rights as humans? At minimum, the right to exist. We understand that the cycles of life indefinitely rely on death in order to live. In order to survive, something must die. It's a fact. We, re we must return the gifts that we've been given and start up negative or better feedback loops. For example, soil absorbs more water when carbon is present. So we're supporting living soil so that supports plant life, that supports biodiversity, that supports a carbon cascade. The only way we will change the world is by changing ourselves and our day-to-day -day actions and behaviors. We keep talking about carbon emissions like they're our biggest problem, but they're not. Human behavior is our biggest problem. And human behavior is causing carbon emissions. A series of solutions lie in our hands and in our gardens and in our communities. It's time to be proactive, not reactive. So here we have a very basic graphic template of a general front garden design that we find to be very successful. So let's just pretend like we want to capture some moisture off of this roof. And you've got about 1,900 square feet. And you can capture just about 1,200 gallons of water on one inch of rain. So if you can move that into a cistern first, Great, we're going to move clockwise here. So you move into the cistern, and once that cistern, depending on what size it is, after that overflows, you can move that into the garden, into your rain garden. And that is surrounded by a homoculture burn. We also employ a plant community approach with interconnected polyculture of plants working together to get moisture into the soil. 
and permeability. But in perspective, this is what it looks like. We are, true, we are nurturing living soils, capturing and storing as much rainfall as possible, using landforms and hugel culture to increase infiltration <coughs> and biodiversity, breaking up surfaces to increase permeability, and using plant community approach to support that carbon cascade, which supports life which in turn will then further the cycles of life for all non-human beings as well as human beings for generations. Here's another perspective. We're going to add our Google culture. Do you see the smile? I see a frog smile. Now every time you see a Google culture burn or think of it, I want you to think of frogs because we need to be protecting those as well. We're going to add some water to it. And once that system, once that construct has come together and is working, Water is going to move both gravitationally and laterally through the soil by means of plant roots and mycorrhizal fungi. We are pulling carbon and pollutants from the atmosphere on our properties, or in our gardens, or in our communities, and keeping them on site. But what else is this garden doing? It's cooling the environment. This is from 1959 to 1988. And I'm pretty sure it looks a little bit more warm than that now. At least 224 locations around the world have uh, set record heat highs in 2018. So we went out with our infrared thermometer and we tested hardscape surfaces versus plant surfaces. And this is just one example. Decomposed granite. There's a 50 degree difference between that and native giant wild rye. I'm advocating for plant covered cities. This is infrared evidence that plants cool the environment. The bottom line is hot, bare soil, concrete, asphalt, mulch even, contributes to heat island. But mulch is also a beneficial thing. But it also does contribute to heat island. So when you see those landscapes that are all mulch with a few native plants in it, they're not cooling the environment. A cool, covered soil equals cloud formation. Carbon down, cooling up. We've been asked to speak about tree selection, and we've mentioned some excellent ways to set your trees up for success. But here are some details that have been recently shared with us, and it's crucial that, it is crucial that someone qualified is selecting their trees. That's the bottom line. Someone who understands what tree is appropriate and how to inspect the root collar while purchasing. How to correct a de defective circling root. How often do you come across this after the tree is over 20 years old and already dying from a burning root? Now, just so you know, these, these details are going to be available to you in both EWG and PDF. Um, <clears throat> the observation of young tree growth with early correction as needed, so not creating co-dominant stress. And how to shave a root ball. Most of the time, I see trees and shrubs that have been in their containers for too long. Knowing how to identify, correct, and even reject a tree is really important. Tree growers do not like me. <laughs> we have already provided these PDFs and EWGs for you, so I believe I actually should be sending those out to you. So um, here are some case study solutions in our work, in both residential and public space. This is a project in Hollywood. Uh, when I walked out of this property and I saw this pink and purple colonial revival home, I knew that I needed to nail these clients. These were my clients. <laughs> I love that house. So um, we honored this garden. They wanted a fully California native plant. They contacted us through the Theodore Paint Foundation. And they wanted a full uh, native plant garden. So we honored the home and the architecture with a classic colonial revival design. That includes cruciform features and axial pathways and alleys of trees and parterres, you know, boxwood hedges, but Sam's boxwood, right? <laughs> so we, we were able to pull that off with uh, native plants with the exception of a, a vegetable garden and a rose garden up in the front. But you see these? These are our culture burns and our rain gardens here. And on every project, we do calculations. I'm sure so many of you do this already. You calculate your root space to see how much water you can keep on site and put into the ground. When we started the project, we had all of these materials. The concrete, that not so pretty flagstone patio and pathway, and a lot of the trees were really sick, and a lot of the, uh, they needed to stay on site. That was just a fraction of the trees. 
through, so through creative saw cutting and reorganization of the materials and the trees, we were able to repurpose just about everything, except for some of the old irrigation. The only thing imported was salvaged brick and maybe some decomposed granite and a little amendment. <clears throat> and this is what it looked like in spring of 2019. Um, all of that concrete you saw in the front, which was a parking spot, was repurposed in that fountain. And every last bit of that purple pat, uh, flagstone patio was uh, somehow used. And we did it. We did it. But you do it on site. Sometimes you can't plan for those things. Sometimes you have to keep your design just a little bit loose and a little bit flexible. Um, that's part of our new model. It's just kind of alleviating some of that control there. Um, I mean, even the side of the house looks gorgeous. This is a native garden. A lot of people think that native gardens are not beautiful and they're scrubby. This is what the front looks like. Even that fountain is old and salvaged, salvaged and repaired. That's what it looked like last summer. Uh, see that hoople culture burn in the front. And the rain garden in action. And this garden will be on the 2018, 2020, 2020 Theodore Payne Garden Tour in March. We'll be on the Saturday tour, so if you're not coming down, Make sure to come on over and say hi. Um, <clears throat> and this project in La Quiñada, which we just completed, um, we incorporated uh, Google Culture Burns, cisterns, and reuse of materials. I just wanted to go through this really quickly. Google Culture Burns can look so different based on the materials that you get. Art form, it's an art form. It's an art form. So you're putting together a piece of art as you're building up. But most people just see it as a bunch of mud and wood, right? So this is, I love it when we get onto the site and all of the materials are organized, the different types of green waste organized. It makes the, the workshops and the building so much easier. And uh, this is what it looks like right now. Lots of bulbs right now, little baby plants. And what I love about this is that one of the clients who's having heart palpitations over the size of the cisterns and the size of the hugel culture burn. She didn't realize what she was getting into. You know that sort of buyer's remorse period halfway through a project, right? She was in tears, hysterical. So I had to go over and hold her hand and just say, Jody, I mean, seriously, you are going to be the highlight of La Cunada with this. But secondly, when the people come over and ask you, geez, Jody, what's up with that big sister? I want you to look to them and say, look at Australia. I want to be that much better prepared to support my community. These are hooked up to fire hose. There are fire hose hookups for local fire department because this is a high fire zone. We are going to have uh, rotary irrigation on top of the roof and so on. All of this material was salvaged. Here you can see through creative saw cutting and a repurpose of, of salvaged brick, we reuse everything beautifully. So that was our residential project, and he's going to talk about the Crescent Farm. And he may have to stop me. I could talk about this forever. <laughs> this is very exciting. Uh, the Crescent Farm is the LA County Arboretum. It was to be a one-year demonstration. Whoops. I pushed the wrong button. There we go. Um, it was to be a one-year demonstration for Wildflower in LA. And my, I agreed to captain this flagship of Wildflower in LA if I were allowed to show water optimization techniques, including pools, of course. So uh, in this garden, which now has over 17,000 students brought through it each year to learn about water optimization techniques, we have hoogles, we have an arid climate orchard, we have ethnobotanical food, Plants. We have lawn substitute panels over there on the right. Through here, this lawn substitute panel, lawn substitute panel through here, through here, through here, and up here. This garden was in lawn for 80 years. It now uses 97% less water, produces food, and is now considered the flagship of the LA County Arboretum. It's been used to train 33 county agencies in sustainability practices and regenerative work. 
So let's go through it a little. Uh, here you're looking at the arid climate orchard. This is not on irrigation. It gets hand watered when necessary, but these trees were chosen for their uh, water, lack of water, Mediterranean and South Asian species, as well as some indigenous plants. Uh, you're looking at a infiltration basin there that didn't infiltrate. There's caliche there, which we encounter all over California. We hit caliche with a pickaxe. I excavated that area. What am I going to do? I can't have standing water in a public park. There's mosquitoes. There's a West Nile virus. There's all kinds of things. I can't have standing water. I must have it infiltrate. So, Sean and I have a spirit animal called mycorrhizal fungi. <laughs> so I lay down the cardboard in there. Why do we use cardboard? Because just like with your children and grandchildren, if you offer them a mycorrhizal fungi, if you offer them sugary breakfast cereal or healthy steel-cut oats, ah, yeah, you already know. They're going for that sugary breakfast cereal. Well, cardboard is cellulose, trees, ground up, put together in an organized pattern with glue. Mycorrhizal fungi metabolize that glue as a sugar. So they're getting pre-chewed cellulose with sugar <laughs> added. Yes. <laughs> oh, how, but how does that figure into an infiltration basin? Cover over that cardboard with uh, mulch, then add some rocks to make it look like an infiltration basin, and then wait. And what will happen? The mycorrhizal fungi through those hyphae that exude acid and burn a hole into a root to connect with the root. When they run out of food, they are seeking more. They exude acid into that caliche or rock layer. They eat right through that rock. This now doesn't hold water for more than 20 minutes, even when it's filled. Mycorrhizal fungi are the secret of the universe. <laughs> These are lawn substitutes, and there's a closer look at that um, uh, infiltration basin. This garden is planted with low water plants and native plants um, to teach people different things they can do. Those lawn substitutes uh, can be watered, uh, karakia, for example, can be watered once a month and mown twice a year. Um, Achillea, uh, yarrow, takes medium traffic and can be mowed twice a year. And in Southern California, it doesn't need to be watered. So I think up here, you'd be even better off. That orchard, oh, that fruit is good because it's not overwatered. Therefore, the fruit is sweeter because of the concentration of sugars. And that is a perennial meadow backed by a hugel. That is a hugel that is now going into its seventh year. It has, you can't see it anymore. It's entirely covered with native plants to the point that the Xerxes Foundation is using it as a model and just gave us a grant to add more pollinator plants in there as, so that other people will grow hedgerows and pollinator waste stations. How many years did that go without being watered through California's worst drought in history? Five years, no water. Yeah. So that orchard, let's see if we, oh, here's what I want. Um, that orchard, we went through a 118 degree day last summer. These scars are still on the trees all over the arboretum. Not one tree in the crescent was damaged. Why? Because we built up the soil through lasagna mulching. We created, created resiliency. The mycorrhizal fungi thrive in that. California native plants have co-evolved with mycorrhizae. 
So look at that meadow. It doesn't look so great in the winter, but what happens in the springtime? And my favorite day last summer was with a woman standing there with her cell phone in front of that garden. And I thought, oh, how sad. She's FaceTiming somebody. And I got closer to her to hear what she was saying, thinking, how can you not look at that and still be on your phone? And then I got to hear her say, I know you don't feel well. Just come and see this. No, I don't know where I am. <laughs> no, it's not the Huntington. No, it's not Descanso. I don't know where it is, but you need to see this. Oh, wait. And she flipped it from FaceTime to letting the person see the garden. Yeah, OK, I'll find out where I am, and I'll meet you in half an hour. <laughs> and that shift is something we all need in all parts of our lives. I have one more thing to share. And I know Sean. I, in the good news category, I work at a place called Metabolic Studio when I'm not at the Arboretum. For the Water District, Metabolic Studio is set up to pull 106 acre feet of water out of the LA River every year. We have the same system here of bringing water in from other places, using it, cleaning it, and then dumping it into the LA River where it goes out to sea with the pollutants that come from street runoff. Lauren Vaughn is a visionary architect who has gotten the permits to pull 106 acre feet of water out of the LA River cleanse it through native plants, and contribute it to three local parks. One of those parks is a state park. In order for them to receive the water, she made the agreement, I will provide the water you need if you stop using pesticides and herbicides. The state park went to the capital. We now have state parks throughout California at the beginning of next year, there will be no more pesticides and herbicides used in our state parks. So what one person does, what each of us do, can make a difference to the future of the planet. Powerful stuff. And if you ever want to come down to Los Angeles and visit her at the Arboretum, she's there on Tuesdays, and we'll give you a private tour. <laughs> Everything right now feels so big and so overwhelming, and rightly so. But in truth, the biggest impacts are even the smallest ones. Every little change we make in our homes and our backyards has a ripple effect. Regenerative landscapes are truly landscapes for survival. We hold community workshops. We do this, we've already done it all the way throughout Southern California, and we continue to do it. We bring people together, and we empower them. Watch this frail woman move this very heavy log. And we teach these things. This is a, called a PB. She's able to move this giant log so that communities can come together. <laughs> communities can come together and do this and feel empowered. This is the one in, in Pasadena. You saw the time lapse. So community truly is the key. So moving forward, as a recap, we must start with the soil in order to heal the land. Carbon is a gift, and we must return it to the soil. Invite water to stay. Learn, support, and protect biodiversity. And be a part of the feedback loop. It's time to be proactive, not reactive. I would like to close with a quote from uh, environmental uh, activist Joanna Macy. <clears throat> Until we can grieve for our planet, we cannot love it. Grieving is a sign of spiritual health. But it is not enough to grieve for our lost landscapes. We must put our hands in the earth to make ourselves whole again. Even a wounded world is feeding us. Even a wounded world is giving us moments of wonder and joy. I choose joy over despair, not because I have my head in the sand, but because joy is what the earth brings me daily and I must return the gift. Ask yourself, 
Are we designing product gardens or process gardens? Can we acknowledge our illusion of control and help Mother Nature do the thing? Reciprocity, gratitude, and respect for living soil are the path to honoring the land. Find your connection to nature and ask yourself, are you gardening like your life depends on it? We are out of time. We need to protest. We must take action. Action is hope. Consider gardening one awesome way to protest. It's time to put your hands in the earth and maybe kiss the ground. Thank you. We've got about uh, eight minutes for questions. Uh, if anybody wants to ask a question for Sean or Lee, uh, here in the front. What are we doing about uh, people putting artificial turf all over the precious uh, tops on it? We're taking it out where we can. I think they make great doormats. <laughs> we can make some money out of it, but um, we need to educate our we need to educate the communities because there is irrefutable proof that they are dangerous and toxic not only to the soil but to human beings as well. They are heating up the environment. Yeah. 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 Talent, yeah. Yeah. In full agreement. Thank you. Yeah, she was just commenting on Doug Tallamy and uh, that we're losing our biodiversity due to the staggering amount of um, artificial turf. Anybody else? Yes. I can't point out here. I'm going to use the microphone so that people outside can hear. Hi, I have a question. So um, I do conservation audits for Santa Bay Water. The question I have is, how is it that the newer construction of homes are putting in lawn instead of putting, some are putting in native plants, but some of them are just going and lying down lawn. There's no way that contractors could just see that we need to have more native plants, they just go ahead and just lay the lawn out. Is that, that's the builder, I guess, or? There's no, there's no place where they can say, hey, you can't put this out. You know what I'm saying? I mean, that's like taking down the turf companies. How do we do that? I mean, the, then that's jobs, right? So education is key. And the reason that we, we, we're here speaking to a municipality, which is wonderful, but most of the time we're speaking to the people and educating them about how to protect the trees from, you know, certain utility companies coming in and topping them or, you know, what to think about. But Americans, in general, are still obsessed with the highly manicured mom. Yes, it's education. And you can see on that former um, eight, one acre of lawn that by putting in biodiversity, we have created a community of people who come in and work in that space to learn about it, and they take that out and they do that work at home. How to stop new developers is by education and protest. Let them know and start at the beginning. Start when they apply for a permit. Show up at the hearings and say, this is not what we want in our community. Yes. Do you have the uh, microphone over here? And then I saw someone over here. I was wondering if you happen to have a plant list someplace, particularly for the no water orchard, but also the, the lawn substitutes and so on that you used in that crescent uh, oh my gosh. section of the... I have an encyclopedia. Uh, oh, well, you we'll just have to incise part of your brain next. So uh, the Crescent Farm is part of the LA County Arboretum, but we have a Facebook page so that you can contact us and get immediate answers and feedback. It's the Arboretum's LA, it's page, no, it's uh, the Crescent Farm at the LA Arboretum. And uh, the Arboretum's website is ar arboretum.org, being the first Arboretum with the website. And uh, you can reach us through that as well. Yes, uh, there was a question right here, yeah. And then, I, I just wanted to piggyback on the, the artificial lawn, which 
drives me crazy. Um, uh, and also using natives in new construction. The city of Phoenix, Arizona, more than 20 years ago, mandated that any new construction, all the front yards, had to be native, native flora. It was just a mandate. So all front yards now are cacti and other things that are native to that area. So, you know, lobbying with your local government can help. And there may be other people that may know of other cities that have done the same. Thank you. And when, when they say, yeah, the, right here, the, yeah. When they say that, it, you know, uh, artificial turf saves water, it actually increases heat island effect, which wastewater. And yeah. kills your trees and your neighbor's trees. Yeah. And, and also the land, the earth, was dust on top oh, of yeah. it. Then you've got weeds growing in it. Yeah. Oh, so I have a question about the trees you use in your Hulu culture. Um, if a tree needs to be cut down because it's diseased, let's say it's got fire blight, do you use... Oh, you have to answer this one. Do you use those trees? Yes. Okay, you already have that uh, pathogen on your property, correct? You're not going to eliminate it by removing that tree. What's the best way to keep it from spreading <laughs> other places? bury it. Yes, create a mound. Now, there are a couple of trees that we don't use in Google culture. Fig and Ailanthus are the two that come immediate to mind, immediately to mind. But we are not concerned, and we have gone through all the science on this, about other pathogens. Polyphagus shot hole borer is one of our biggies in Los Angeles. We bury it and you're keeping it from moving around. So, uh, whoever has the microphone, let's say anything. Go ahead. There was someone right here. Oh, there's a lot of people. Yeah. <laughs> okay. The smallest hugel bed is in the city of Pasadena. Uh, when we did a uh, plant, a lasagna mulching workshop with water and power, Oh, okay. I can't tell who teeny signing to. Okay, we did a, and we were only to be lasagna mulching. And the head of the department came in and said, uh, oh, I see how this is working. And somebody said, Lee, what do I do with this log? And I, well, I have no authority to do it, but I just thought, teach to the moment. And I said, Oh, everyone who has logs, bring them to me, however big or small they are. So the community, lasagna mulching, brought them in. I built a small, uh, what is called a fish scale hoogle. So it's shaped like this. Down slope of the tree, within the drip line, but not close to uh, the trunk. And just um, he said, oh, I could do that at my home. And I said, yes, please do. And and come back for the Hoogle working, uh, the Hoogle workshop. One month later, we went back to plant that site. And the only place that was really moist soil, despite two rains, was where that Hoogle was that had captured and infiltrated. So we like to work from the top down in building and improving soil. And lasagna mulching and Hoogle culture is one of the best. But the key is thermal mass. The larger the wood, it's going to harness the moisture right out of the air. And even after we finished the planting of the hugelkultur workshop, we got all this extra logs. I said, we just said, start placing them around the landscape. In my front garden, if you were to look at my bio, or her bioswale, can't even see her bioswale, there's so many plants. But you'll see where the carrots, prager, tell us the slender meadow sedge on one side of the bioswale is just barely taking off, and it's just out of an exposed log, not buried, there's tons of grass growth around it. So it works. Uh, 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 we're done with the microphone. Yes. Go ahead. That's the last question before break. OK, two quick questions. One has to do with the carbon and nitrogen ratio. I, I know from composting in the past, 30 to 1 is ideal for, for that. When you're building the hoogle culture beds, you keep that in mind because you got a lot of carbon there with the, with the cardboard and the wood and so forth. Yeah. Delighted to answer that. Um, when hugel culture is a replication of a forest floor ecology, when a tree falls, it's not where the open space is that the new trees grow. It's in the shelter of that log. 
So in, we are mindful of carbon-nitrogen uh, ratio, but it is not as significant as you would think. We plant, and we've had to remove one hoople um, for design change. During the one year that hoople was in, in existence, those plants that were on it had spread their roots, and where they put their roots is between the bark and the log. They're pulling nutrients and moisture. So it's not the breakdown of the construct, but it does become a living system. But the nutrients are there, and the plants will find them. How about termites? Well, do you want termites where your log pile is next to your house, or would you like it out here in your hula? <laughs> so you separate the hula away from the house pile. All right, so the, with no more questions, we just want to let you know that we have a sign-up email sheet out here, so you can just add your email to it, so you can get on our newsletter. Lots of wonderful things. We're going to be talking about eco-bricks soon, ways to sequester plastic in non-structural structures. Blows my mind, but we did not come up with this. This has started in third world countries that have been dealing with our trash. Just want to say that. And um, thank you for everything.